Hi everyone, this is Cindy with Ask Nurse Cindy. Thanks for joining me today. I've been a registered nurse for 39 years. And in those 39 years that I've been a nurse, even with all the knowledge that I had about nutrition, I've always struggled with my weight, even as a young child. And I was, for many times, I would look at my career and I'd look at being what I felt was a great mother and I'd think, why can I be so strong in other areas of my life but I can't get a handle on food? And I always felt secretly that I had a food addiction because I thought about it all the time. I discovered the ketogenic way of eating earlier this year in July and it has really set me free. What is ketogenic eating? Ketogenic eating is when you lower your carbohydrate intake and you increase your fat intake and you have a moderate amount of protein and what it does by decreasing your carbohydrate intake you re reduce the cravings that you have so it's really set me free. So I started a YouTube channel, I've started a Facebook page because so many people seem to struggle the same way that I have and I'm still on my journey, I still have a long way to go. But I asked the other day, um, who wants, what would you guys like to know? What, what can I help um, explain? Because I'm all about informed self-care. So here's my disclaimer. As a registered nurse, I'm clearly not a doctor. I'm not here to diagnose, treat, or cure. I encourage you to check with your healthcare professional if you think about altering anything in your diet or in your way of taking care of yourself. But I want to share with you my journey, and I've been doing that for the past six months or so, and I get a lot of questions from you, and I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for those of, the, of you that have chosen to follow me. So I said the other day, I said, who wants to learn what? What is it that you want to know about? And if you ask me a question and I do a video on that topic, I'll give you a shout out. So today's shout out is to Katrina Prego. So Katrina, you asked about blood sugars. You asked about the impact of fasting and spiking and this type of other thing. So where I'm gonna do, Katrina, is I'm gonna start with the basics and then we'll build on that in a subsequent video. But there's your shout out. Thanks for asking the question. So let's start with the basics of metabolism. This is very important that we understand this. So I have a very limited prop budget. I have ping pong balls and I have a little disc that I got at the dollar store. And I wanna have this symbolize a red blood cell. All right, so it's important because when we think about blood glucose or blood sugar and what happens when we eat and how does our body react, first we need to understand the importance of our, our respiratory tree. So when you and I breathe, we take in a breath of air and the oxygen molecules that are in our atmosphere come into our lungs. The red blood cells are passing through the lungs and capillaries and they've got these wonderful little receptors. That's what these little Velcros are. And these little receptors love to have oxygen stick to them. And each hemoglobin molecule on the red blood cell can hold four oxygen molecules, all right? So then as this goes and it tumbles through the capillaries and it tumbles through them, it drops off the oxygen and it picks up waste products. And that comes back through the kidneys and through the liver. We breathe out some of the carbon dioxide and that just happens over and over again, several times a minute. We're bringing in groceries, we're taking out the trash through our red blood cells. So that's one thing I want you to remember about respiration or breathing is that we have receptors on our hemoglobin molecule inside our red blood cell. Each hemoglobin molecule can carry four oxygen molecules, very important. Now, we're gonna switch over to nutrition for a minute. You and I choose to consume foods. There's three macronutrients. There's fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. Fats break down into fatty acids. Proteins break down into amino acids and carbohydrates, whether it's a fruit, whether it's a glass of milk, a glass of juice, a piece of bread, those will break down, those carbohydrates, whether they're complex or simple, are gonna break down into little glucose molecules, all right? These glucose molecules <laughs> fall, <laughs> they, they come out of the intestines, and they go into the bloodstream. So we've all heard about blood sugar, and I think we've all enjoyed the commercials where people are hangry. Right? And that's a true thing that happens. If your blood sugar goes too low, if you don't eat for a long period of time, you get shaky, you get irritable, you're, you're, you have brain fog. What happens is the glucose is then escorted into the bloodstream. And what's interesting is that our pancreas gets a, gets a Twitter. It gets a little text message, an instant message, whichever you like to use in social media. And it says, incoming glucose and so the pancreas says oh my god look at how much they ate they ate this big bagel or they ate a big bowl of pasta and it pushes a lot of insulin into the bloodstream what the insulin does it is a fat storage hormone so when we eat a high carbohydrate diet when we eat a lot of carbohydrates throughout the day we're making our insulin come out of the pancreas and we are forcing all of this glucose to go into our cells and the cells look at it and they're like, 
Oh, uh, thanks. Um, you just gave me some of this a couple of hours ago. I really didn't need it, but maybe there's going to be a famine. So I'm going to store it. And the reservoirs, our storage reservoirs for reserve energy in case, in case there's a famine, are our fat cells. So it goes into the fat cells where it's stored in case there, it needs it later and it gets pulled out. But unfortunately, as Americans, we have um, overwhelmed our bodies with so many carbohydrates that over time, what happens is we have so much glucose in our blood and our insulin gets sort of tired. And, and their cells gets really tired of having to answer in the door knock. If you've ever had, you know, uh, a lot of door-to-door uh, -door salesmen knock on your door, you just become resistant to it. So what happens is we end up with insulin resistance and the glucose doesn't move out so quickly. All right, so that was, that was the second concept. We've covered it. We breathe in oxygen. The oxygen sticks to the red blood cell. There's four molecules per hemoglobin molecule. And these are on and off, on and off. It's like one of those bus stops. People get on, people get off. And the average life of a red blood cell is uh, three months, 90 days. Now what happens is when there's glucose in the bloodstream and there's a seat on the bus, if you will, it's in the process of some of the oxygens coming off, it's dropping off the groceries. It goes, oh my gosh, I like that little receptor. And it actually fits in the same receptor as our oxygen molecules do. The only problem with this is that this never gets off. Until this red blood cell dies, this is stuck forever. So what will happen, especially if you're pre-diabetic, you've been told you're pre-diabetic, you are diabetic, your doctor every three months, because that's the average life cycle of our red blood cells, every three months they are going to check what's called your hemoglobin A1C. And what they're looking for is the percent of glucose that's attached to your molecule, to your hemoglobin molecule. And the sad thing for us, especially if all our lives we've been eating a high carbohydrate diet, is we continue to bump off more and more oxygen and we replace it with glucose so we reduce the blood flow to our very tiny capillaries this becomes what they call in medicine glycated glucose has an affinity for protein it likes to stick to protein and what happens is this just continues to escalate and the higher your a1c is the more inflammatory processes you're going to have going on in your body and the harder it is for you to lose weight it's harder for you to oxygenate. It's harder for you to have a um, feeling like you have energy that you're used to having or you would like to have. Think back as a child, you had all this boundless energy. So one of the things, um, Katrina, that we want to think about is when we choose to lower or restrict our carbohydrates back to more of what our ancestors ate. We didn't we couldn't go into the store and get buy a loaf of bread. We couldn't do a drive through back then. So they ate vegetables, they ate meat products, they ate a lot of fat. Fat was prized back then. When we lower that carbohydrate intake, a lot of things start to happen. Our pancreas is not constantly working over time. Our cells, the resistance to all that constant bombardment of insulin become less resistant to it. They become more accepted to it. The, as the red blood cells turn over, and new ones are formed, they don't have all that glucose attached. So what we can do by choosing to lower our carbohydrate intake is we can lower our hemoglobin A1C. And that is so important. It is a natural way to lower your A1C. So if you've been told you're pre-diabetic, if you are diabetic and your A1C is above six, that means more than 6% of these available seats on the bus are consumed by a glucose molecule instead of an oxygen molecule, you can, you can change that without drugs. Um, certainly I'm not telling anyone to stop taking their medicines, but by lowering that carbohydrate, and when you do choose carbohydrates, choose the green leafy ones, choose things that are rich in color because that means they're rich in all the antioxidants and vitamins that we need. So that is what that's gonna do. You are gonna have more normalized blood sugars. You aren't going to have these roller coasters. When, when I was eating a normal American diet, what we call standard American diet, which is very sad, standard American diet, sad, um, I would eat a high carbohydrate meal, blood sugar up, it would spike up, my insulin would be forced to come out, whoosh, the insulin would do its job. It was just doing its job and it would rush that, that glucose into my cells. I'd feel my blood sugar drop and in a couple of hours I'd be like, oh my God, I need something to eat. And it was up and down and up and down. So what happens when we restrict our carbohydrates and we eat more natural foods, we are going to stabilize those blood sugars. We're going to give our pancreas a rest. Our cells are going to have a chance to not constantly have someone knocking at the door saying, let the glucose in. 
and we're going to allow this red blood cell as they turn over as they naturally uh, some are being born every day some are, are dying every day we're going to be able to lower this a1c without drugs without shots and you're going to find that your health improves dramatically because glucose attached to our hemoglobin molecule is one of the great drivers of chronic inflammation in our body so I know that's a lot of information. I hope it was something that was logical, that made a little bit more sense. Feel free to ask a question, uh, type a comment. I'll follow up Katrina with more about blood sugar spikes and how do I know if I've um, spiked my blood sugar by what I've eaten. A lot of times you can tell, you feel a little jittery, and then in a couple of hours you're hungry again. When I eat a, a diet with adequate amounts of fat, moderate protein, and just a little bit of carbs, my my appetite really just stabilizes. I can go five, six, seven hours today and not think about food versus I thought about food all the time. So if you two have been struggling, I encourage you to research this, check with your healthcare pr practitioner, make sure that you are being sensible in your approach, and I look forward to working with you again in the future. Thanks, everybody.